Welcome to JT Ministries. Today, Pastor Gary brings you another sermon on the book of 1 Samuel. I hope you enjoy it, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. If you are looking for a Bible, don't forget to check out the links below. There are also links to other social media platforms. Thank you for tuning in. Now, here is Pastor Gary. 1 Samuel chapter 14 is where we left off. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that your goodness and your mercy pursues us all the days of our lives. And we get to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We get to be with you because you opened the way through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so we're grateful for the cross. We're so thankful for your goodness and your mercy. Bless this time in your word tonight. I thank you, Lord, for all those who are here and those watching online. And we commit this Bible study to you, that you would be glorified, Lord, and that we would be edified, that we would be built up in our faith. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, um, we have been making our way through about half of chapter 14, but let me give you a running start from where we were uh, last Wednesday night. Uh, We've been drawing some principles from each of these chapters as we've been looking Uh, for the moment at the uh, first king of Israel, Saul. Uh, We've moved from Samuel, the last judge of Israel, who is also a prophet at this time, to the first king of Israel, who is Saul. And we're going to eventually make it to the life of David, who will succeed Saul. But for the moment, we've been drawing a few different principles from each chapter. So I'm not going to go back too far, just the chapter before. Chapter 13, uh, waiting on the Lord is always better than operating in fear. If you remember in chapter 13, uh, Saul showed this leadership ability and he rallied the Israelites to him that he would lead an army against the Philistines, um, uh, or uh, rather against the Ammonites in battle. And... um, uh, but when, when he, he was successful in that regard, but then when he went into battle against the Philistines, uh, the people started to abandon him, and he was afraid that people would leave too quickly, and the Philistines would come in too quickly, and so he resorted to operating in the role of a priest instead of a king. Samuel was of the tribe of Levi. He was the priest and the prophet, and only he could offer sacrifices to the Lord. And so Saul uh, didn't wait for Samuel. Samuel showed up right on time, but Saul um, took it into his own hands to offer sacrifices to the Lord. And, And so as a result, he gets rebuked by Samuel. And in chapter 13, Samuel tells him that the kingdom is going to be taken from him and given to another whose heart is after the Lord. And of course, it's a reference to David, who at the time has not even yet been born. And so waiting on the Lord is always better than operating in fear. With God, 99% obedience is 100% disobedience. That's what we also learned from that incident there uh, in, in chapter 13. And though the odds may be against us, God is for us. God gave them a great uh, victory over the Philistines at the end of uh, chapter 13, Jonathan, the son of Saul, is now on the scene here, and um, he is going to play a very important role in Israel's history. He is a young man, uh, fighting age, so he's at least 21 years of age, uh, but he is a man of courage. He is a man who really trusts God. He is um, going to do things uh, not in a reckless manner, but in a faith-filled manner, And he takes charge in chapter 14 while his dad, King Saul, is kind of sitting around with the troops. Jonathan turns to his armor bearer and says, you know what? We can go ahead and advance against the Philistines ourselves. And so he takes his armor bearer in chapter 14. And just between the two of them, they strike down 20 of the Philistines, which then leads to this chaos that God uh, brings about among the Philistines. In fact, in chapter 14 in verse, uh, if you want to just glance back to verse uh, 15, it says, and there was trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people, the garrison and the raiders also trembled, and the earth quaked, so that it was a very great trembling. NIV says it was a panic sent by God. The Philistines start turning on each other, and it was all brought about because Jonathan and his armor bearer 
trusted God and said, you know what, we can fight these Philistines and with God's help, we can defeat them. And so as they lead the charge and the Philistines start turning on each other, it's a testimony, a principle that we've gleaned from chapter 14. God does great things in response to our little faith. King Saul sees the Philistines fleeing not understanding that Jonathan and his armor bearer have led the charge and God used that just a small representation of faith on behalf of two men to bring about this great victory over the Philistines. So Saul and the rest of the army jump on the bandwagon. They start chasing the Philistines uh, out of town. And that's where we left off last week, how God does great things in response to our little faith. And that was verse 23. So there in chapter 14, verse 23, it says, So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to beth So let's continue reading there at verse 24. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening, before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. Okay, so King Saul has imposed a, an oath. He's made his army take an oath that they will not eat anything. This is a, uh, a, an imposed fast that he is ordering his army to take. And... Um, it's really unclear why he felt like he needed to do this, because at this point, Saul is already slipping spiritually. He's not a praying man. We don't see him as a praising man. We don't see him as a man who's very devoted to God. And so why is he imposing this fast onto his army? But nevertheless, he makes him swear an oath. I don't want you to eat anything until we've defeated the Philistines soundly, because they've just kind of chased them over to the next town. And Saul wants to pursue them. Well, they're growing faint at this point. You know, you have a whole army, and they're not allowed to eat anything, and so uh, they're growing faint. But it says here in verse 25, Now all the people of the land came to a forest, and there was honey on the ground. And when the people had come into the woods, there was the honey dripping, but no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. So they've all sworn this oath. There's this, you know, I don't know if it just happens they stumble into a a huge beehive or if it's just, you know, God's provision. But regardless, Saul has demanded that they not eat anything so nobody's tasting the honey. It's tempting. It's right there. They want to desperately. They're getting faint. We'll see the word faint used a couple times in the following verses. But they don't because they're afraid because Saul has made them swear this oath. Now, someone who's not in the camp at this time to know that Saul has made the army swear this oath is Saul's son Jonathan and his armor bearer. So they don't know that the oath is is in place. So look at verse 27. It says, But Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with the oath. Therefore he stretched out the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in a honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his countenance brightened. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you have low blood sugar and you start eating some honey, your, your, your countenance is going to brighten. And then, uh, because also honeycomb cereal is marvelous. And so, you know, he's, he's eating honeycomb cereal with honey. And anyway, verse 28, then one of the people said, your father strictly charged the people with an oath saying, cursed is the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. There's the first use of the word. I mean, you know, the army is, is weakened at this point. They haven't had anything to eat. It's pretty hard to have an, an, an army fight in a battle if they aren't eating anything. But Jonathan said, notice, my father has troubled the land. The word troubled there in Hebrew is a car. A car means to, um, it's the effect of what happens in, with water when it starts to boil. And it's, and it's, it's a word in Hebrew, a car means turbulence. And Jonathan is talking about how his dad has created turbulence in, in the country. Not peace, which is what the king should be promoting. But there's this turbulence. He's causing trouble uh, in the land. Now, this is the first breakdown of the father-son relationship. We're going we're gonna to have a little glimpse into the family life of Saul and his sons, and in particular his son Jonathan here, as Jonathan begins to say, you know, my dad... 
He, he, he doesn't have the best interest of the country at heart here, and he's troubled the land. And so Jonathan goes on and he says, look now how my countenance has brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found. For now, would there not have been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? So it was typical and God allowed after a victory that the victorious army would help themselves to the spoils of the people that they had just defeated. And so such was the case. But the problem is that as the uh, Israelite army is helping them to the spoils, which would have included the livestock left behind when the Philistines fled, they can't eat the livestock. They can't eat any of the spoils because they're still under this oath for the entire day. But now, sundown happens. So look at verse 31. Now they had driven back the Philistines that day from Michmash to Aijalon, so the people were very faint. There you have the word again. And the people rushed on the spoil. Okay, so now what's indicated is sunset, which to the Jews, sunset is the start of another day. So now this is a new day. So now the people rushed on the spoil and took sheep oxen and calves and slaughtered them on the ground and the people ate them with the blood. And then they, yeah. And then they told Saul saying, look, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. Now this looks worse than it is. What do I mean? It almost looks like, you know, they slaughtered a lamb and then started, you know, digging their face into, you know, the, the, the warm flesh of this animal before it was barely dead. That's not really what the language suggests. What it suggests is they didn't take time when they killed the animals to let all the blood drain out, which was required by the law, both in Leviticus chapter 17 and Deuteronomy chapter 12. God had said, before you eat of a slaughtered animal, you are to drain the blood from the animal. So they hadn't properly drained the blood, but it wasn't like they were sitting around eating raw flesh here because they were that hungry. You know, I can remember growing up though, although I will say, um, this is back in the day when, I don't know, I guess it was safer to eat like raw meat, but my, my mom, she's still alive. She's like 86, so it didn't, it didn't take her early or anything. She would make hamburger, and I'd watch her eat some of it as she's making that meatloaf or the hamburger patties. And it was very common for her. She'd eat raw hamburger. How many of you had a family member who ate raw? How many of you actually eat raw? Let me just see. Okay, there's a thing called salmonella poisoning. So, like, I don't know why you would be doing that. My son eats raw eggs. I keep telling him. I said, do you know, like, there's salmonella and stuff like this and and E. coli? like, Like, anyway. So you all have more faith than I do, I guess. So, um, yeah, E. coli boy over here, he eats raw eggs. So anyway, all right. It's like, he's in, like he thinks he's Rocky again, you know, and like, you know, downing the milkshakes with the raw eggs and all that good stuff. Well, so it's not quite like this. Like they're not eating raw animals here. They just haven't allowed it to drain. But having said that, they are violating the scriptures. They are going against what God had commanded. You drain the blood of the animal completely before you, you, you roast it. And they weren't allowing the blood to drain before they roasted it. Now, one of the commentaries I read said this, and I, I forget who to give credit to. I should have written it down. But um, it says this, forbidding people to do what God allows increases their temptations to do what he forbids. You see, it was not God's command that the Israelites should refrain from eating. Um, That was Saul's doing. I don't want you to eat today. He imposed on them a command, an order, that was greater than what God intended. Whenever we impose a command or an order or a law that is greater than what God commands, it's called legalism. Legalism, some people think, will help restrain you from sin. What they don't realize is legalism actually tempts you to sin more. The human nature is always curious about things. 
and often curious about things that we shouldn't get involved with. So it's, it's you know, when, when you tell a kid, like, no, don't, like, like, if you put candy in a room and say, now, don't touch the candy, what do they want to do? They want to touch the candy. They want to eat the candy, right? And so the, the incentive, when legalism is imposed, it often provokes temptation because now you're being told don't and can't. Now, I'm, I'm not in, in any way denigrating the commandments of God. There are plenty of commandments of God that say don't and can't, okay? But where God imposes the commandment, then there's a righteous reason behind it. When man imposes something greater than God, it's legalism, and legalism does not restrain sin, it leads to it. It tempts it. Legalism is a trap. Um, You know, some of you might have grown up in legalistic homes or um, went to a legalistic Christian school. Um, I've heard the horror stories over the years. Where, where because there are rules that were imposed greater than God's commandments, it led to this, as soon as I get out of mom and dad's house, I'm going to go crazy. Okay? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So be very, very careful, even in your own parenting, if you still have kids at home, that you set boundaries and rules that are consistent with what God requires and not more, not less either. See, when we do less than what God commands, that's, that's liberalism. That's theological liberalism. When we do more than what God commands, that's theological legalism. And both are wrong. And so we have to always strike that balance of what God requires of us. And in this particular case, Saul was imposing something more than what God intended. And as a result of imposing this day of fasting for no particular reason then it provoked their haste in eating the animals. They roasted them, but they hadn't let the blood properly drain. So they ended up violating God's commandments because of legalism being imposed upon them. It's not an excuse for sinning. I'm just saying this is the tendency of what happens when we get legalistic. Uh, It ends up provoking uh, temptation. And so this is what's happening here. So the people were guilty, but look at, so Saul goes on to say, Uh, the middle of verse 33. So he said, you have dealt treacherously, roll a large stone to me this day. And then Saul said, disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, bring me here every man's ox and every man's sheep, slaughter them here and eat and do not sin against the Lord by eating with the blood. And so every one of the people brought his ox with him that night and slaughtered it there. And then Saul built an altar to the Lord. This was the first altar that he built to the Lord. So, you know, he's, he's reprimanding the people for doing something that, that he triggered. And yet he doesn't want to take any responsibility himself. He's, he's saying, you know, you guys are the ones who are guilty of of uh, violating the commandments. He, he takes no responsibility. And then, he, and then he does a very spiritual thing here, but because it isn't met with a genuine heart, he's going through the motions here. He's building an altar. It's the first altar that he built to the Lord. Verse, 30, uh, uh, verse 36. Now Saul said, let us go down after the Philistines by night and plunder them until the morning light and let us not leave a man of them. And they said, do whatever seems good to you. And then the priest said, let us draw near to God here. Okay, so there's some good spiritual advice first. The priest is like, well, before we go, you know, pursuing the Philistines further and and trying to wipe them out, maybe we should draw near to the Lord. That's always a good thing. And so Saul asked counsel of God, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him that day. Now, here's what is inferred. The way that a king in those days or a a priest in general or a leader would discern the will of God was through the practice of, many of you are familiar with this, of two stones that the priest would carry within his vestment, inside his vestment. The high priest would carry two stones. One was called the Urim and one was called the Thummim. And one stone was uh, white and one stone was black and one stone meant yes and one stone meant no. And so God actually would use this process for a time to help communicate his will. 
And so whenever they wanted to determine and discern God's will, they would go to the priest. What does God want? They would ask a yes or no question. The priest would reach into his vestment, pull out a stone. And if it was the yes stone, the answer was yes. If it was no stone, the answer was no. So what's implied here is that the priest asks a question of the Lord. Do you want to speak to King Saul? Goes into his vestment, pulls out a stone, and that every time he pulls out a stone, it is no. That's why the verse there says, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of the Lord? But he did not answer him that day. He did not answer him because likely the answer was, no, I'm not talking to him today. And Saul said, come over here, all you chiefs of the people, because the answer wasn't enough. All you chiefs of the people and know and see what this sin was today. For as the Lord lives, who saves Israel, though it be in, though it be in Jonathan, my son, he shall surely die. But not a man among all the people answered him. So Saul assumes that the reason why God is silent and not answering the question as to whether or not he should go to battle with the Philistines is because there's sin in the camp. There's sin in the camp. That's why God is silent. And Saul assumes that there's sin in the camp. And he says, even if the sin is found in my son, Jonathan, he's going to die. That's what he says. And the people didn't say a word. They didn't answer him. Verse 40, then he said to all Israel, you be on one side and my son Jonathan and I will be on the other side. And the people said to Saul, do what seems good to you. And therefore Saul said to the Lord God of Israel, give a perfect lot. So that's the Urim and the Tumim. Like, I want to draw out the answer, yes or no. And so Saul and Jonathan were taken, but the people escaped. And Saul said, cast lots between my son Jonathan and me. So Jonathan was taken. And then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you have done. All right, so picture this. Saul says, I want uh, uh, the whole army on one side. And Jonathan and I are going to stand on another side. We're going to cast the lot. In other words, the priest is going to tell us. And so the question is, is the sin among the camp of the, uh, the army. Pulls out the stone, priest says no. So then that means it's among Saul and Jonathan. And then the next question is, which one of us? Where's their sin? Is it me? Stone, no. Is it Jonathan? Stone, yes. So then Saul says, what have you done? What have you done? And Jonathan said to him, I only tasted a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand. So now I must die? Like, this is unreasonable, right? And Saul answered, God, do so and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. All right, some more notes, some principles here from chapter 14. Unnecessary vows lead to unreasonable actions. There was, again, no reason why Saul needed to impose this vow. Whoever's done wrong is going to die. Why? This isn't, they're, they're not sinning against God. They're sinning against your foolish oath that you made them take. You can't eat any food. Anybody eats food, you're going to die. And then his own son, which he doesn't know until now when it's exposed, his own son eats some of the honey and he's now, now you got to die. Why does he have to die? That's an unreasonable thing. It's a terribly unreasonable thing. Well, because you made a vow that was unnecessary and unnecessary vows, unnecessary promises. Listen, don't get into the habit of making these unnecessary promises. You promise what God wants you to promise, but don't go around promising this and promising that because your word is your bond. And when you start saying things, you better do what you say. So it's better not to make a vow at all than to make a promise or make a vow and break it. And Saul is guilty of making a vow that was unnecessary, so now it's leading to these unreasonable actions. And on the heels of that, here's the third principle from this chapter, pride breeds death, humility breeds life. Saul is too proud to admit that he made a foolish vow, that he imposed a foolish oath. So rather than taking responsibility and humbling himself, where everybody can live, humility breathes life. He could have taken ownership and said, you know what? That was a silly, rash oath I made everybody take. Okay, Jonathan, you ate some of the honey. Okay, but son, wow, what a valiant warrior you are. Instead of that conversation, it's, 
Well, I made this vow and the people broke it, or Jonathan did at least, and so I'm going to kill him. My own son. Instead of being humble about it, he's full of pride and it leads to, he wants to kill his own son. Now look, the people intervene. Verse Verse uh, uh, 40, um, man, these numbers keep getting smaller and smaller the older I get. Verse 45, I'm holding out still, no glasses needed. Verse 45, but the people said to Saul, shall Jonathan die? Who has accomplished this great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not, as the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. And so the people rescued Jonathan and he did not die. All right. God bless the people. The people realized this is a, a foolish vow. You made us swear. Jonathan didn't even know about it. He eats some honey and you want to kill your own son. Now, do you see the spiral downward that Saul is taking? I mean, he, he's wanting to kill his own son over a foolish vow. He starts out as a very reluctant leader and he's going to continually progress to this proud um, paranoid, controlling king who now wants his own son dead and will try to kill David because David is a threat to him. I mean, this guy, he kills a bunch of priests. I mean, his story is going to unravel even further, but you, you're getting to see a glimpse of it now. In verse 46, then Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. And so Saul established his sovereignty over Israel and fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the people of Ammon, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, against the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he harassed them, and he gathered an army and attacked the Amalekites and delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. The sons of Saul were Jonathan, Jishui. Jishui also, some of your Bibles has a, have a footnote. He's also referred to as Abinadab. And Malkishua. I love that name, Malkishua. So it lists three of his sons. Now, for, for you Bible scholars, there's another son who's not mentioned in the list, and his name is Ishbosheth. And uh, Ishbosheth is not mentioned here only because. This is a list of his fighting sons. So we, we'll come to Ishbosheth later. There's a, a precious story about him. But he's not among the fighting men, and there's a reason for that. So it just lists these three sons, Jonathan, Jishuai, and Malkishua. And the names of his two daughters were these, the name of the firstborn, Merab, and the name of the younger, Michal. And Michal comes into the story even further when we get to David. So keep her in mind. Verse 50, the name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, and the daughter of Ahimaaz, and the name of the commander of his army was Abner the son of Ner, Saul's uncle. So Abner, the son of your uncle, is your cousin, right? So Abner is Saul's cousin, and Abner becomes Saul's general of his army. And then it says, Kish was the father of Saul, and Ner, the father of Abner, was the son of Abiel. Now there was fierce war with the Philistines all the days of Saul, and when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him for himself. So he drafted him in the army. It's like, you know, you see a strong guy and you're going to draft him into the army. Let's go into chapter 15 for a little while. Samuel also said to Saul, now the prophet Samuel is back on the scene here, and he says to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. All right, this is a difficult passage. Let's, let's be honest about it. What, what God through the prophet Samuel is telling Saul to do here. And it's, it conflicts with our sense of what is right and what is wrong. So before I comment on that. Let me just back up a little bit and, and say this. Back in chapter 13, uh, well, even before chapter 13, it, it gets played out in chapter 13. Samuel gives Saul very specific instructions. When you get down to Gilgal, I want you to wait seven days. I'll show up on day seven and I'll offer the sacrifices. 
That's, this is when I alluded to at the beginning of our Bible study, uh, Saul did not wait. I mean, it was day seven, but he didn't wait until the end of day seven. And Samuel shows up before the end of day seven. Saul is already guilty of sacrificing the animals, which was something Samuel said he would do. And so back in chapter 13, Samuel had already told King Saul, you have disobeyed God and the kingdom is going to be taken from you. It's as if that's strike one. And Saul should learn from that, like going forward, because what basically God was saying through Samuel back in chapter 13 to Saul was, the lineage of your family will not inherit the throne because of your disobedience. When we get here to chapter 15, there's new instruction that Samuel gives Saul, and it's almost as if I can hear Samuel in a sense saying, now I want you to listen very, very carefully, Saul. You blew it back in chapter 13. Don't blow it here in chapter 15. Okay, so like, listen very, very carefully to my instructions. Because the sad thing is, by the time we get to the end of chapter 15, I'm just giving you a little preview, a little spoiler alert. Saul is going to violate the commandment yet again. And at the end of chapter 15, it's not just that the heritage will no longer pass through the line of King Saul to his sons, but Saul himself will be removed and replaced. So obeying the Lord is a very critical thing. And so Samuel spells it out very clearly here about Amalek. Now, who is Amalek? Amalek was the name of a king. It's really a title, not not even a, a, a personal name. And after this king comes the name of the people, the Amalekites. God, through Samuel here, is imposing judgment on the Amalekites. The reason why God is imposing judgment on the Amalekites is, and you can turn back or you can just listen, back to Exodus chapter 17, all the way back in Exodus chapter 17, when God delivered the Hebrew slaves after 400 years of slavery in Egypt, And led them by the hand of Moses to the promised land. The first people to attack the Hebrews as they were moving from Egypt to the promised land were the Amalekites. The Amalekites attacked the Israelites in their journey. And as a result of attacking the Israelites and God defended them, God pronounced a judgment back in Exodus chapter 17. And he said this to Moses, I'm going to read the last few verses of Exodus 17, starting at verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name. So he named the altar, the Lord is my banner, Yahweh Nisi in Hebrew. For he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Okay, so make note of that. And your Bible's back here in 1 Samuel chapter 15, just kind of in the margin of your Bible where Samuel gives this command to King Saul, I want you to wipe out the Amalekites. It's in reference to what happened in Exodus chapter 17. The Amalekites were the first ones to waylay the Israelites on their journey from Egypt to the promised land. And so now judgment is coming to the Amalekites. And when you read the the judgment statement, the sentence that God pronounces, this is where it is difficult to our sense of reason, okay? Especially, (coughs) excuse me, especially when you get to the part about, I want you to slaughter also the women, the infants, and the children. And so this violates our sense of conscience and morality. So let me say just a couple of things. First, God is not obligated to do things the way we think is fair. God is the supreme judge of the universe. And God can pronounce sentence upon any that he deems guilty. Now, when it comes to this particular sentence, here's the question. How long should God wait in his patience with our sinfulness before he pronounces judgment? I want you to just think, you know, I'm asking a human question from a human rational standpoint, all right? Like, what's fair? How long to wait? Let me ask you this. 
let's say somebody, I'm talking about another, another earthly human being, let's say somebody violates you in some horrible way. Um, you know, robs your house or, or you know, just think un- unimaginable, unspeakable things I don't, even, I don't even want to say. What somebody might do against you. You want swift judgment and justice for them, don't you? I mean, don't, don't for the moment, like, don't, don't wear the Christian hat and say, well, I just need to forgive and forget. Okay, I get that. I get that. But I want you to go with me for just a moment. And when, you, when you've been wronged, I mean, offended, violated, criminally, I'm talking, okay, you want some judge to throw the book at that person. You want justice, okay, and rightly so. You should want justice. And how long should it take before justice is meted out? That would satisfy your desire for justice. Let me tell you in this story how long God waited from Exodus 17 to 1 Samuel chapter 15 to impose judgment on the Amalekites. Are you ready for this? More than 400 years. More than 400 years he waited for the Amalekites to turn from their sinful, evil ways and to turn to him. It wasn't unheard of. You remember that the first people that the Israelites came to in the city of Jericho, Rahab, a harlot, a Gentile Canaanite harlot, she was a prostitute. She turned to the living God. She put her faith in the living God. She and her household were spared from the city of Jericho while the rest of the Canaanites were destroyed. So God is merciful. He will accept anyone who turns to him. He will accept anyone from any part of the globe, whatever your past may be, who, who, who sincerely turns to God and is repentive about their own sin because God is a merciful God. And he waited 400 years for the Amalekites to turn to him before he said, time's up. So while to us it may not make rational sense when we think this seems like such a horrible thing when we think about infants. And by the way, his sentence was to wipe them all out. That doesn't necessarily mean, though, however that infants and children were sentenced to hell. It just means there was a death sentence to the Amalekites. But God in his mercy, you know, he rescues those who are too young to be able to make a decision for him, who are too young to be accountable because they don't have the ability to turn to the Lord. You know, God did that in the case of the the Hebrew people. When When the Hebrew people left slavery in Egypt, An entire generation didn't believe God, rebelled against God in the wilderness, sinned against God. And what did God do? He sentenced that generation, but not their children. He said, your children will go into the promised land, but not you. Why did he hold the kids accountable? Because they were too young to be able to make a decision to be held accountable. So God in his mercy, there's a place of grace for infants and children. So even though there's a death sentence to the Amalekites, that doesn't mean that he sentenced infants and children to hell. So God is a merciful God, but he's also a just God. And he waited 400 years before he imposed this sentence. Okay? Amen. So thank God that he's merciful with you and with me because his patience is for salvation. He's not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness, but he is patient, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance, the Bible says. And so God is patient with us. This seems like this indiscriminate slaughter, but it wasn't like that at all. And thank God that he doesn't deal with us that way today. Well, verse 6. Sorry, it's verse 4. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. He's got quite an army here, 210,000. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. And then Saul said to the Kenites, go, depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. And so the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Okay, fair warning. Saul says, you know, I've come here on a mission uh, from God, and and I'm going to take out the Amalekites. You were Kenites. You're not a part of them. You live among them. You better run before you die with them. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive 
and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword, but, oh, that's not good, but Saul and the people spared Agag, that's the king, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good in their eyes, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Oh, this is not good at all. They're, they're not obeying. Saul is not obeying the word that Samuel spoke to him. Now look, verse 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Okay, so notice, Samuel's not with Saul at the moment, but God speaks to Samuel the prophet, and he says, listen, I regret. Now circle that in your Bible. That is what we call a theological anthropomorphism. What is an anthropomorphism? That is just a fancy word that means sometimes God uses human language to communicate in a way that human beings can understand his heart. It's not like God has like, oh, whoops, I made a mistake, so now I have regret. He's communicating in anthropomorphic terms to help us understand his heart. He's saddened by this, but it's not like God makes mistakes. That's not what regret means in the language here. He's using a term sometimes he does use terms, and you're going to see he uses regret at the end of the chapter too, to communicate to us in human uh, terms so that we can understand his heart. And he he says, I I regret this. I, I regret setting up Saul as king. He's turned from me. He hasn't followed my commands. And it grieved Samuel too. Notice verse 11, and it grieved Samuel and he cried out to the Lord all night. So he's just, have you ever had one of those restless nights just all night in prayer? Just something so heavy on your heart, you're just, you're just tossing and turning all night long, praying, praying, maybe napping a little bit, praying. This is, this is what Samuel's going through here. Verse 12 says, so when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel saying, so some tattletales, <laughs> you know, hey, Samuel, psst. Saul went to Carmel and indeed he set up a monument for himself. Okay, you see how he continues to slip? Saul's no longer this humble, reluctant leader. He's setting up monuments for himself, statues, and he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. And then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, and he sees him coming, he goes, hey, blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Are you kidding me? No, you haven't. But see, he's so self-deceived at this point. And so now, look at this. So he goes, hey, Samuel, good to see you. I've done everything that God told me to do. And Samuel said, verse 14, what then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? So Saul's Saul's like, I did everything that you asked me to do. By the way, by the way, I did it. By the way, I've done everything. You know, all of that's going on in the background. And Samuel's like, wait a minute, hold on just one second. If you, if you say you've done everything, and that included killing all the livestock, that's what I told you. What's, how come I'm hearing, bah, how come I'm hearing, moo, in the background? Because not everything's dead. And Saul said, notice, they, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Here's another point from chapter 15. Sin is still sin even with a spiritual spin. You can tweet that, friends. That's worth (laughs) tweeting right there. I came up with that this afternoon. What's he doing? He's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah no, don't, don't, don't mind that, you know, the, the bleeding of the sheep and the lowing of the, of the oxen and the cattle in the background because we only saved them. The people wanted to, by the way, what, what even me. I, I kind of didn't want to, but the people, people kind of made me do it. And so they wanted to sacrifice an offering to the Lord. That's the only reason why we spared them, please. You disobeyed God, don't put a spiritual spin on it. You ever run into these kind of people who say, you know, listen, let me just share with you a prayer request. It's a prayer request. And then they proceed to gossip about somebody else. It's the sin of gossip, but they've spun it in a spiritual, it's just a prayer request. I'm I'm not gossiping, it's a prayer request. (laughs) 
Did you hear about this? Did you hear? Did you hear about this? Pray, pray for that brother. Pray for that sister. You know, that's what I, I've heard this. I've heard this. It's not, a, it's not a prayer request. It's just plain gossip. But you've spun it to make it sound like it's all super spiritual. You know, so, or, or, or like in the home, yep, some teenagers here. Don't mean to call out the teenagers. I once was one, so I know I can speak from experience. You have just enough spirituality. This is the reason why you disobeyed mom. I didn't listen to you, mom. Didn't listen to you. Because you know what? I felt like the Lord really wanted me to do this. <laughs> really? Well, let me tell you what the Lord's telling me to do. Get closer. You know what I'm saying to you? Just give me, I'm going to give you the right hand of fellowship right now. That's what I'm going to give you. So there's a whole bunch of ways we can spin stuff. No, it's gossip. No, it's disobedience. No, it's whatever. And so Saul's a master at this. He's like spinning the sin to make it all sound spiritual. The only reason we kept these animals, Samuel, Sammy, my friend, was just to worship the Lord. And uh, Samuel said to Saul in verse 16, you be quiet. The translation in the Message Bible, just shut up now. Just shut up now. And I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. We'll pick it up there next week and see what the Lord said. And there's much to learn from this story. This guy's life, it's tragic really on many levels how Saul's life just really unravels. But much to learn I think it was Mark Twain who said, I can always learn from somebody. They can at least serve to be a bad example, right? And so Saul's one of those guys, unfortunately. We'll pick it up there next week. Read ahead. Lord, thank you for this time in your word. And I pray that we would learn these things. We wouldn't just read them and think about poor Saul. We would look it into our own hearts and see if there's anything there in us. Do we justify sin in some way and we spin it with a spiritual angle. Lord, forgive us. You want our obedience. So we pray that we would be men and women and young people who will seek your face and desire to please you, to live a life that honors you, to do what you tell us to do. Nothing more. It's legalism. Nothing less. It's liberalism but to walk circumspectly according to your word, to be faithful in all that you tell us to do and to not do, that you would be glorified, honored, and pleased. This is our prayer. Help us, Lord. We're no better than Saul. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.